All right, good day and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another Live the Fuel show. So this evening, I am bringing on, yes, another new co-host for you. But this gentleman I stumble across thanks to our multi-multi co-host, uh, Vinny Tortorich, and his popular, very successful podcast called Fitness Confidential, so plug to him. Uh, but this gentleman is not just a doctor. Uh, he's actually... I'm going to go ahead and say kind of revolutionizing, if not revitalizing, knowledge around being a carnivore. And not just being a carnivore, but the love, which I actually love, of red meat. <laughs> so that, keeping that in mind, he's a family man. He's clearly, obviously, said, obviously in, with the medical background, he knows his way around meat and steak, and we're going to dig into that as well. Uh, but, I mean, a 51-year-old athlete, this guy is Jack. I mean, he's not just a carnivore. He's not just a physician. He's a very fit gentleman. So without further ado, I'm going to bring him on the show here. Welcome to the show, Dr. Sean Baker. Hey, Scott. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. It's, it's going to be fun to talk about steak. That's one of my favorite topics. Dude, it's not just one of your favorite topics. I follow you on Instagram, and I feel like I'm not working hard enough because you got like four steaks in front of you. And <laughs> I mean, what is the, let's jump right in there. What is the average pound consumption per meal of your steak ratio? For me, it's usually uh, usually about two pounds is a pretty standard sort of meal for me. I mean, okay. if, I eat, if I eat less than that, I don't feel like I got anything. I can I can go up to three or four pounds pretty easily, pretty comfortably. But generally, you know, in a day, it's probably about four pounds. But you, you know, you got to remember, I'm very active and I'm and I'm a pretty big fella. I'm six five, close to two hundred fifty pounds, and so uh, you know, it takes a lot of a lot of fuel to feed the machine. You know, you got me beat. I'm uh, six four, one ninety five. So I'm a uh... Uh, but I'm, I'm a cyclist. It's like, I just don't train and I'm a, I'm a CrossFit coach. I'm a CFL one. Um, actually this shirt I'm wearing right here. Hold on. There you go. Uh, it's from S Y R CrossFit and, uh, uh, which is my friend's CrossFit gym. And they, they have uh, every year they do, it's called crush. They do an internal competition for the, the members. Like, so some members might not be ready to go and they're not, that outgoing to get into an actual competition. So he does it internally just to help people test where you're at with your training, your strength, everything. So every week he releases a new workout and you have to compete. And I actually, I just, I just won it. I have to still go get my trophy. <laughs> so nice. um, That's one, of, one of the things, cause I, I, you know, CrossFit, I mean, I like some of the aspects of it just for me being my size, I think would be a kind of a disadvantage in a number of events. I don't know how you do being six, four, if it's difficult for you to do the gymnastic stuff, I, I would anticipate that'd be difficult for me to do. Uh, I've, I've developed the, you know, obviously I always recommend people going with strength first, right. And actually building a, a for example, gymnastics, technically a pull-up is part of a gymnastics training. Right. And most people sure. think that we're just doing those crazy high speed pull-ups all the time. We're like, no, no, no. You still got to develop a strict pull-up, develop the strength before you can start tying them together and doing that kipping pull-up, for example. So unfortunately, yeah, when I go to CrossFit gyms and I drop in when I'm traveling and stuff to random boxes, I have to go find like the tallest rig. <laughs> because my, my toes are dragging on the on the floor. So yeah, I'm just I just think that you know the the actual motion you have is longer than some of the typical guys that win the comps with that are and using five. I, I can tell you, or, what's your sleeve length? You know your sleeve length? Thirty nine. Damn, you got me beat, dude. All right, I'm a thirty seven plus, so yeah. I'm always getting like custom shirts done. You got a thirty nine. Yeah, I'm like a monkey, man. I got to tell you, I was a good deadlifter because of that, but uh, it, it does me no favor in pressing, overhead pressing, and. Yeah, you know, stuff like that. That's for sure. Well, trust me. See, uh, no. So one thing I know about you, sir, is you can crush a rower. Uh, Vinny and I were joking around about that because, like, you crushed that row. I thought you were going to snap that thing in half when I watched that video because that's my thing. Like, nobody can beat me on a rower because we have it's that and doing uh, wall balls. Like, that's our two yeah. like advantages in in CrossFit training. <laughs> uh, but doing you know, snatches overhead and, and I, we have to move weight a very long distance, uh, up. So. Well, especially when you're doing it for time, cause it just takes longer to do the, mo the motion, but yeah, the, the rower, I definitely, uh, I think I could win that part of a CrossFit competition, but I don't yeah, know. What was your time on that? Uh, 500 meter row. I did one fourteen. Um, so, I mean, that's, you know, I've got, you know, I hit a four fifteen in one minute, 415 meters in one minute. I rode a one, a hundred meters in thirteen point four seconds, and then I'm, I'm, I'm shooting to try to see if I can break the uh, thousand meter world record. So that's going to be, should be around two forty nine or so. So for a thousand meters, and you're running the damper at ten, right? Uh, for the for the sprints, I do. Yeah, yeah for the sprints, yeah. I do. I like to I like to take advantage of my strength and uh, you know the higher stroke rate stuff. The the damper 
works a little better higher, yep. I think. There's two schools of thought on rowing. And, and right now, for our listeners, you know, we're geeking out about rowing, right? But, I mean, this is one of the, I don't want to say oldest, but it's one of the most simplistic and easiest, I think, training methods to really – you don't need a lot of fancy gear. That's one thing I love about CrossFit. Like, I have – I'm starting to build my own like mini CrossFit space in my garage. I got a squat rack in there. I got the bumper plates. Uh, I'm a big fan of kettlebell training. And, um, but having a, you know, something as simple as a rower, that'd be sweet because rower's been around for a long time. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's kind of interesting. Rowing used to be like the number one spectator sport in the United States back in like the 1920s or something like that before football and all that stuff came in. So really? It used to be very popular. But, I didn't uh, even know that. Yeah, it was. It was a. There's a. There's a really neat movie called or a book out called Boys in a Boat, which kind of talks about how popular it was back back when they, you know, these guys from uh, University of Washington won the gold medal. They, you know, they beat Hitler Hitler's team. They were big underdogs or a bunch of scrappy, you know, low income college kids that, that came together and won the gold medal. So it's really, it's a really good read. It's, it's it's inspirational. You don't have to you don't have to be a rower to appreciate. It. I really, really well, thought the, that was good. The, the interesting thing is like so we have uh, right here in my area, the Bethlehem Allentown area, north of Philadelphia, we have. Uh, some big universities like Lehigh University, Lafayette College, and they all, they all have rowing teams. And then obviously Philadelphia is famous for what's called Boathouse Row, right? They have all these beautiful old, 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 every university had a house along the river and that's where all their boats are stored. And that's where all the rowing teams train and compete right there in Philadelphia. So um, yeah, I know it's that, and all the, all the Ivy League schools seem to have a rowing team. So it seems yeah, to be, yeah, old, like, it's like, t- it's tied to old money. <laughs> yeah, it, it absolutely is. Yeah, it's an expensive sport to get into a lot, in a lot of cases, or it can be, you know, I mean, to have a, well, if you got your own boat, it certainly is. But I mean, those, those things are not cheap to maintain, but uh, no. I've not done it on water. So, I mean, I, it's, it, it might be interesting one time. I trained with uh, an Olympic gold medalist who kind of got me started on, on the indoor rowing. So he, he worked on my developing my technique and, uh, but I've only done it indoors. I, I don't think, I think I'd sink a boat because it's too damn heavy. <laughs> Well, it's funny you talk about um, great coaching, right? And because uh, I know you do a lot of coaching and training too. And my the, when I first moved back here to the East Coast after living out west, um, I had never really trained in a CrossFit gym. I actually found CrossFit because well, you'll appreciate this. So I, I served out west uh, for a few years as a hotshot, serving as a U.S. Forest Service wildland firefighter. So when I left the corporate world, went and did that in my early 30s for a couple of years. I never knew what the hell CrossFit was, but then I showed up and we had this uh, Native American. Uh, squad boss AJ and this guy was a he would do two a days every day this guy just worked out like a madman and he said hey when you guys show up like our basic fundamental training was all CrossFit but it was hey we're in the mountains of Arizona CrossFit so we're training at our base was at 5,000 feet so it was high altitude training we didn't have a rig we had a we had one rower (laughs) I think we had like three wall balls we built our own boxes for box jumps. And then we had one of those big metal shipping container Connex boxes out back. So we took uh, scrap metal and welded pull-up bars off the roof of that bad boy. So it was so high, you had to do a box jump just to go up and reach <laughs> the, the pull-up bars. So um, that's how I learned <laughs> CrossFit. I, that, that's what got me out of the traditional gym world. And I kind of never went back to a traditional, like I used to be, you know, Gold's gym member guy and all that stuff. So. Yeah, I sometimes still go to those places and it's almost, I almost, I get sad because I see, you know, so much inefficiency and people, I mean, largely they're just, they're just wasting their time and it just kind of, I just kind of scratch my head when I go there, but I mean, it's all, I've been it's out, all magazine been, fitness, I call it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some of that is, and it's, you know, you see some of this, particularly the, some of the girls now, they're doing their, their lunges while they're curling, while they're walking across the gym. I mean, I just kind of shake my head and laugh at that stuff. I mean, it's just. The, you know, the, the value of that is just more for taking a picture than, than actually getting anything done. So it's kind of yeah kind of comical to me. But, I you know, when I've been on vacation, I mean, if I've got nothing, I mean, I'll go out and run sprints and I'll find a big rock. And I'll take a big, you know, 60-pound rock and throw it around. Just, just throw it up over my head and throw it in front of me. And, you know, you can, you can, you can do some pretty effective stuff with, with minimal equipment, which I've found, which is pretty helpful. Well, and, again, with the right form, the right technique, because that's what always comes first, like you said, that's the whole point of technically CrossFit, right? Like, I have people say, oh, well, like, I, I love race. I do uh, occasional mountain bike racing. I'm a huge road cyclist. So that's probably why I'm leaner. Like, I do a lot of endurance training. And um, so it's funny because, like, actually, this past year, I really got into Vinny's lifestyle of NSNG. I, don't know, I was actually almost – almost pretty much right there anyway. Like I, I never ate bread anyway. I wasn't a bread, bread and grains guy. Uh, but I really started doing, trying his fat, ad, fat adapted training, like the whole trying to test out keto and ketogenic and all that. And 
Um, I've, and I've been now experiencing more of your style. So I'm like, wait a minute, I always love me anyway. And uh, I actually, when I grew up, we always would fill two chest freezers every winter on the farm in the garage. My dad would come back from the butcher. The whole back of the pickup truck was just full of meat, chicken, steak, beef. We knew, we knew where everything came from. And uh, two years ago, a buddy of mine came over and we were making burgers and he brought the beef and it was just, it was amazing. I mean, the flavor was phenomenal. I'm like, where did you get this? And he's like, oh, it's my own cow. I was like, oh, I grew up that way. I was like, you could do that still? <laughs> he said, yeah, man. There's a, he's like, a guy I went to high school with, has a ranch just outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. He will only raise what people put a deposit down on, right? So, so you put a $100 deposit down, and now you're officially locked in for your quarter of a cow. And he will spend all this year, for example, raise, I have another deposit in again, and he'll spend this year raising that, and then next year, I'll have my beef. So um, I figured you'd get a kick out of that because I have a quarter of beef out in the freezer, man. I got my steaks, I got my ground beef. And when you source the meat the right way, oh, the flavors are just right there. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you as, as someone who's only eaten meat for now, 14 months, you definitely start to appreciate the, the subtle differences and different cuts of meat and different sourcing of meat. You can certainly, you, you become pretty, uh, in tune with that stuff. But I call it, you know, like when, when, when there's a meal, you know, I eat just meat, but some of the other members of my family will eat other stuff. And, you know, I consider meat the food and then everything else that's, that's kind of decorative stuff. And so the accessories, saying, yeah, they're the accessories, but the actual food is the meat. And so, you know, when you ask what's for dinner, no one says broccoli, you know, that's just not the answer. You know, it's, what do you have? And you're having steak, you're having chicken, you're having, you know, some kind of fish. I mean, that's dinner, that's food. And all the rest of the stuff is, you know, like I said, I think that's just flavor enhancement, decoration, and, uh, you know, kind of entertainment stuff. Well, so we're bringing that up now. We're, we're definitely getting into our beef, right? So and part of your brand I kind of hinted at in there was obviously this carnivore thing, right? Which we are. Well, I mean, I've read the book Omnivore. Um, I do agree. That, I mean, technically by science, we are omnivores. So that's why I tell people like who Vinny and I got a joke around with that too. It's like, dude. I mean, I get it. if you want to choose to become a vegetarian or a vegan, I'm not trying to bash them, but you are missing out on some serious nutrient density. Um, just going to throw that right out there. I don't know about you and, and, and I'm actually, I do know about you, but how would you help somebody understand this whole concept about nutrient density? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, if you, this is a, this is the simplest way I can make this and, it, and it's so simple that some people can't get their head around this because, you know, if we, if we ask, what are we? You know, we are animals and we are made of animal tissue. And so if you're, if you're going to build a, if you're going to build a car and you went to a junkyard and you need to collect all the car parts to build the car, you could probably do that. You know, you, you have the same sort of equipment, right? But if you went to build a car and you had to go to the grocery store and you needed to find out what you could do to build a car, you might find a little bit of metal in the shopping carts. You might find things you could scrap together to make a car, but, Building animal tissue with animal tissue is the most effective, efficient way to do that. And so mm -hmm. you can kind of put those pieces together with, with fruits and vegetables and grains and stuff like that. But it's very inefficient. And it's, you know, there's a lot of sort of negative things, negative things that come with that. And so, uh, but yeah, from a simplicity standpoint and a nutrient density, animal tissue is extremely nutrient dense. It's highly, highly bioavailable. We are very good at digesting and absorbing it. Um, you know, all the, all the pieces are made for us. They're not made for plants, you know, plant pieces, you know, if you can rearrange them, you know, sort of detoxify them, put them back the right way. You can, you can kind of make those parts, but it's more of a difficult, more inefficient process. Well, and it's so, and I joked around this earlier, actually, I'm going to go ahead and do a little screen share here for our video feed because I can't wait to share this one photo of you. I've, I've already scrolled down to the bottom of the pick. There it is. He's got a big old... <coughs> Big old plate of meat. <laughs> yeah, that, that was for, that was from Iceland a couple weeks ago. I, was, I, uh, I know. I was jealous. You went. So, was, what brought you over there? Uh, so, there's a nice guy named I Rouseford who uh, who's a carnivore himself, and he is actually starting a little carnivore revolution himself in Iceland. He is the head nutritionist uh, and, and chef at a hospital, a little on a little tiny island off of Iceland, and he has been a bit of a nutrition. Uh, uh, guru for, for, for the country for a while or, or participates quite a bit. And so there's a lot of people that he's influenced and they've gotten, you know, Iceland only has about 300,000 people. They've already got about a thousand people doing the carnivore diet in Iceland. And so, really? Wow. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a significant percent of the percent of the population. So I went out there, I gave a little presentation on carnivory and then some of the stuff on the training that I do, the style of training that I like. 
And uh, we had some, we had just great, we had a nice carnivore sort of meet up at the end at this restaurant. They, the whole restaurant, they made an entire carnivore menu just for us. You know, <laughs> uh, lobster and, and lobster and lamb and beef. And, uh, you know, it was foie gras and it was, uh, it was, uh, you know, foie gras foam and, you know, all this just, you know, just beautiful, wonderful, tasty stuff. And so we had a great meal there. Well, and, uh, and I'm, it's funny. So our listeners right now, I'm actually scrolling through. Uh, oh, one one of his sites, yeah. the carnivore training system, you have all these amazing before and afters of people and, and admittedly, and I'm going to go ahead and throw this out there. Like this one picture here, this gentleman, uh, take guy on the left, subtract sugar, starches, processed foods. I'm glad he messaged it that way because we're not even just saying these, these pictures are totally possible, not just being on all meat, but anytime I see people post a before and after. I really want them to admit what their prior lifestyle was like, right? Like you're not just saying, Hey man, it's all about the meat, but it's like, like this guy is, he removed a lot of other crap that he should not be consuming. So that's also part of the wake up call for a lot of people too, is that when they try a new lifestyle, I don't like the word diet. Um, but I think when I, when I think, and actually what's your feedback on this, the word diet to me, because I studied psychology when I did my marketing background is to me, it symbolizes something short term. Um, only because of all these stupid diets and, and advertisements and everything else out there these days. So uh, I, I feel like I can't use the word diet anymore because I feel like people are just going to keep trying a new diet, right? I was like, listen, this is about building a lifestyle. So what's your, what's your feeling on that? Well, I mean, it's the word diet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it sort of connotates a temporal, temporary state. Uh, you know, if you use it correctly, you know, you ask, well, what's, what's your animal's diet? And they pretty much keep the same diet through their life. You know, what's, what's a, what's a, zebra's diet you know you can make mm -hmm. you can use it in that context and it makes sense they eat zebras eat grass all day and all, all night that's what they eat but in mean, humans we use a word to to indicate we're going on a short-term diet and so it, it, it diet tends to indicate some degree of temporary short-term time restricted thing that we're going to do for a short period of time and i think that you know that's the problem with that with using it in that context Okay. So, and I like that. Thank you. So, I mean, it's, we're on the same page here. That's what I like about this because and this is something that I'm always trying to share when we get into health and fitness on this show and we're trying to you know, get through to the masses is that part of this story is also, and I'm sure you can admit this with, with the beef conversion, right? Or this, the meat heals uh, mission that you have. I'm going to do some sharing here in a minute too, is that you got to understand people that making a shift, especially lifestyle related, when you do it so fast, so quick, and so drastic, you're going to probably observe some failures, right? I tell people like you either, unless you're the kind of person who's like all in and you can make it happen, great. But I see so many people fail or, or basically trip along the way, like going over speed bumps because they aren't taking the right time to allow the shift to happen and allow the, sh the changes to happen. So like, for example, if somebody was new hearing this today and they're going to consider the healing power of meat, right? When you're in your new brand of meatheals.com, which I'm going to share here in a second, how do you get through to people and help them understand about this? Hey, hey, man, like you're going to go through some change and some metamorphosis and you got to be patient with yourself. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the uh, big, you know, the big picture is, you know, you're eliminating a bunch of stuff you're not designed to eat, you know, whether it's the vegetable oil, it's the processed, refined, sugary stuff, you know, so we have to get that out of the diet. Um, you know, the question becomes, you know, what can you eat safely and what, uh, you know, what will affect you, what, what doesn't affect you? Uh, you know, it is a big shift. It's, a, it's quite honestly, the, the physiologic shift is less than the psychological shift. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a lot of psychological buying. You've got to go into this thing with a positive attitude like you do anything, whether it's a workout, whether it's a, uh, you know, a new diet or a new job. You have to go in it with a positive mindset or you're going to set yourself up for failure. So you have to have a little bit of mental buy-in before you can even do this. You know, it's good to do the research. It's nice to have people that have gone before you that can kind of show you the way. That certainly helps. But there is going to be a physi physiology shift. There's no doubt about it. And if I were to go on a vegan diet tomorrow, I would feel pretty bad. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, just, just, just because I'm shifting, not, not to say that the diet is, is also not very bad. You know, it's, it's also bad, but, uh, but oh, I mean, God, just, yeah. just when you make a drastic change like that, there's going to be a big physiologic shift. Sometimes that can be accompanied with a lot of, uh, you know, negative symptoms. It's like, you know, in some cases, it's almost like, you know, withdrawing from a drug, you know, and, and you have to kind of realize what's going on. You know, some people it's worse than others. Some people go through it pretty easily. So it's variable. 
um, you know, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make a significant change in a couple of days or even a couple of weeks. It's, it's something you have to sort of invest in for any change. You know, you got to. You know, you're not going to do two CrossFit workouts and make your whole determination on how how effective CrossFit is based on two workouts. You know, it's thank you. Where where you know you're going to have to buy and do it for several months. You know, at least give it a good you know a good a good shot. I was literally having that conversation last night with some people. We were hanging out, and the guys like. Uh, this was after, after, uh, the Valentine's day dinner. And he's like, listen, man, he said, um, my fiance were hanging out and then he, we were just chalking with him. He's like, yeah, he's like, yeah, I, I thought I tried CrossFit and I didn't like being sore all the time. <laughs> and I just started laughing and I'm like, okay. Um, I'm not sure how to respond to that. <laughs> I was like any form of fitness, especially if you're taking care of your body, it's gonna, you might get a little sore, right? And usually that's your body talking to you. Um, I don't know. I mean, as a physician, how would you rein in on the whole soreness topic? Well, I mean, you know, obviously uh, that's, you know, as you know, it's, it's, it's a temporary thing. If you're not used to doing something, you're going to be sore for a little while. Usually that passes uh, pretty normally. I mean, some degree of soreness is fine. You know, you have to, you have to differentiate from actually injuring yourself. And I think the people that you know, only go sporadically are going to be sore every time they go. So you've got to, you've got to put some consistency there. That's just basic, uh, you know, basic uh, advice from, for anybody training. I don't think you need physician advice to talk about soreness. But uh, <laughs> I will say, and this is something that you may have seen that a lot of people talk about, is that their recovery and their soreness on this carnivorous diet is, is significantly le less. And that's something I've seen as well. And so if, you're, if your CrossFit buddy doesn't like being sore, tell him to eat some steaks before he goes. Well, uh, I actually do talk a lot about that because, and granted, it's not necessarily meat related, but uh, after my first year of firefighting, um, and, and I'm just going to stop sharing here on meal, meatheels.com, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you check out this site because, uh, and we'll have you dig into this more too, but Meat Heels has a lot of before and afters on it. It's a pretty cool new site that uh, the doc here has been launching, and I want to dig more into that. But just on this topic, um, I didn't, dude, when we were on fire camps and stuff, like these fire camps are we're put together. Hey, there's a big wildfire in the mountains of Montana, right? Everybody gets either flown in, shipped in, and we were hot shots, so we're supposed to be able to survive, you know, a couple of days in the mountains on our own anyway, and blah blah blah. So there was times where they would set these little mobile, I don't know, like triage slash fire camp cafeterias, and like, like eighteen wheelers would come in and they would transform. Like there's, they're like kitchens in the back of a tractor trailer and it transforms next thing you build these military style tents and you can start feeding hundreds of thousands of firefighters. But let me tell you, the food quality was not there. I mean, oh, it was just, yeah. I mean, if we had beef, it was not that good. Um, there was a lot of powdered eggs. It was just, anyway, you, you take that and then you multiply. And this is where I, this is when I learned about uh, uh, detoxifying the body and allowing the body to heal. And I didn't, I didn't even know what the hell adrenal fatigue back then. This was 2010. And you know, you take 16 hours a day on a fire line and you go two weeks straight before you get a day off because you have to take days off from, you know, medical health <laughs> finally after two weeks of doing that. And then you do this all summer long. So my first year, that whole, whole summer, we did 1900 hours, 2011, we did 2000 hours. The average nine to five employee works, you know, the 40 hour week, you get two weeks of pay vacation, maybe that's 2000 hours in a year. So I did all that work in six months. I didn't know my body had never gone through anything like that before. And that's back when I was just doing the, the occasional supplements from GNC and vitamin shop. Cause I didn't know any better. Now I won't step foot in one of those places. Uh, but I did not know what I was doing to my body. And afterwards I learned about throwing in some occasional fasting and allowing the body to heal, recover, because my, my energy was in the tank. My workouts were crap after the fire season for like a next month or two. And I don't know if you ever get into discussions around adrenal fatigue and, and that level of exhaustion, but I clearly had built up exhaustion that I never experienced before in my life. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, that kind of sounds like my, my, my surgical training, quite honestly. I mean, it was, you know, a lot of times it was 40 hours straight, no sleep. You go home for six hours you know, you go right back and do another 40 hour shift without sleep. You know, you put in 110, 120 hours a week and you do that for, you know, five years in a row or almost since that was before the hours restriction really went into effect where we were allowed to work, you know, 120 hours a week. And so I kind of beat you up. So I, I was, you know, you know, pretty exhausted, pretty stressed. I still trained, you know, I got up at four o'clock in the morning, go to the gym, you know, you just beat yourself down to, down to the, you kind of grind yourself pretty thin. And, you know, obviously, 
we need to recover. We need sleep. We need to take, you know, we need to take a break when our body tells us we need a break. And recovery is just as much a part of the, uh, getting stronger and getting more effective and efficient as an athlete or, or as, as just a human being as, 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 as putting the work in. And so you have to, uh, you have to pay respect to that stuff. Now, some people, you know, some people can, can like uh, me in particular, I, I've gone high volume, high intensity, high frequency for a long time. And I, I've sort of uh, done well with that approach. Not everybody does it, particularly as they get older. Uh, I'm finding that the diet has helped me significantly in that regard. And so it's, it's another interesting sort of facet to this whole puzzle, you know, as to, as to uh, how do we get the most performance, maximize our results without injuring ourselves or without burning ourselves out and without getting depressed. Well, I think it also comes back to the whole point of my sharing that story now and now your story about the whole, that level of educational overload and mental exhaustion. Long story short, whether we're exhausting our brain power or our physical muscle power, et cetera, it comes back to your whole point here of how are we fueling the body? And that's why, like, that's part of my whole brand too, like live the fuel, man, fuel your health, your business, your lifestyle. Like, how are you fueling your body for you know, maximum educational periods when you're like, when I went back to school on nights and weekends before the firefighting, like I, I went back for it to go get, do a degree and I was working full time. And then I'm going to school on nights and weekends and I'm still trying to fit in my fitness. And at the, at the time I was also working a side job teaching spinning classes. Cause I'm a bike, I'm a biker and I'm doing 6am spinning classes. So it was just, and you really learn over the years, how important it is to fuel the body. Right. And when you get the right nutrients in, Oh, all of a sudden, the body's performing differently. <laughs> and to your point, it's recovering differently as well. Yeah, I think, you know, you know, we have to kind of put nutrition as, into perspective. You know, some of it is, uh, you know, with a normal diet, you know, some of it's fuel, some of it's nutrition, and some of it's just kind of waste that we can't use. And so I think uh, you can actually, actually cause harm to your body by eating the wrong stuff. And so then your body has to have extra time to recover to kind of uh, – you know, compensate for all the damage you're doing from some of the foods you're eating that are incorrect for you. And so what I'm finding now is, you know, uh, what I will argue is I'm, I'm, pr I'm providing myself with fat, which I need. I'm providing myself with protein, which I need, and then glucose, which I can make. And so I, I, I'm, I'm, well I'm well fueled right now, and I feel I perform well, and I feel well, and I recover well, and I actually require a little less sleep than I used to, which is also an interesting uh, sort of, if you want to call it a side effect of this diet. Oh, interesting. Well, let's be real. You're, when you sleep, that allows supposedly healing and that's re you're, you're resting the body. So, but to your point, if the body is healing and recovering faster, as well as the brain, et cetera, do you need as much sleep? I don't know. Uh, well, that's what, that's what we're finding. I mean, we're finding that the quality seems to be very good. Uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm looking at hundreds and thousands of these people now that are doing this and the quality seems to be pretty good for most people once they kind of get through that transition phase, but they do say the quantity is less. And so before hmm. if they, they require eight hours of sleep. Now they seem to do better with six. And they, you know, for me, I mean, I'll, I'll be out. I mean, I, I fall asleep very quickly. You know, if uh, my girlfriend, I joke around, she, uh, she'll, she'll put a TV show on, you know, and I won't make it through the first 15 minutes and I'm gone. I'm asleep and I won't wake <laughs> up until, you know, that may be 10 o'clock, but I'll wake up and I'll be, I'll be wide awake at 4 a.m. Boom, ready to go. And I, I kind of lay there you know, for a little bit, just kind of thinking uh, until it's time to get up. But I'm wide awake, you know, ready, ready to roll. And I, and I know, and I, you know, I, I go through my whole day and I have plenty of energy and I, you know, I train my butt off and, uh, you know, get through my day without any issue. Well, and I'm all about, um, I'm all about hacking life and looking for peak performance. So I take a lot of stuff seriously. Like, I, I don't know about you. Like, do you. Are you familiar with blue, blue light and blue blocking and all that? Yeah, no, certainly. And that's why, you know, like I said, I, if it was me, I wouldn't watch the TV. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I definitely think that may have a, have a role. I think there's some, we have to respect their circadian biology. I think when the lights go out, it's time for us to kind of wind down and go to sleep. And uh, yep. I, I try to do that. I try to, you know, I also, you know, I, I do some cold showers and some cold immersion to try to, you know, get the benefits from that. I, ah, the, uh, oh, the Wim Hof method. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm not exactly using his breathing techniques, but I certainly appreciate the cold stuff. I think it does help. I think it probably helps with chronic inflammation. You know, I think there's some controversy about when to use it in regard to training. You know, some mm -hmm. people think that if you do it right after a hard, you know, strength building session, particularly ice baths, that it may impede, uh, you know, protein circulation and stuff like that. Well, there's some studies. There's about two or three studies that show that it negatively impacted muscle protein synthesis. So. 
that may or may not be relevant to just a cold shower. I don't know. I often, you know, it's kind of interesting because one of the things that cues us to go to sleep is a drop in body temperature. And so a lot of times I'll take hmm. a cool or a cold shower, you know, an hour before I go to bed. And uh, for me, because I've been doing it so long, it's not particularly stressful for me, but it does cool off my core body temperature a little bit. And, then I, and, I, and I often find I fall asleep better. Well, and I can tell you, uh, and probably because of our lifestyle, and I'm not 100% me like you, right? And again, to refresh for our listeners, like he already gave you a hint, like for the past 14 months, he's been doing, you're 100% me, right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I might occasionally have some eggs and a little bit of dairy once in a while, but I'd say 90. Dude, eggs are are where it's at. I love my eggs. (laughs) Eggs and bacon. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good meal. That's my dad. You know, my dad started doing this stuff back in August. You know, he's about, I don't know, five, six months into it. He, he loves his eggs and bacon. I mean, he eats that every day and he'll have a, a little, he'll cook himself a little roast for dinner. And that's what his diet's been for the last, you know, I think five, six months. And it's kind of funny. My dad never worked out in his life, but he's like showing me his guns now. He's like, man, my husband's got bigger than I've ever been. And that's, you know, that's what, I mean, I got him swinging a kettlebell and I got him doing a few other things. But he's nice. Really well, you got to move the body, especially as you're no, aging. Of course. And, you, and, yeah, sure. and that's where strength training comes in, right? Like the bones need to be reminded that they still need to be put under load. Um, I think that's so crucial to maintain bone strength. I don't know about you as a doctor, but I mean, am I right on that? No, absolutely. Yeah. Strength training is vital for, 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 you know, vitality. I mean, it's important. And, and I think I, I take it a step further because I like to be able to move explosively and sprint and to jump and to throw. And those things require, you know, here's a, here's a, here's a little metric I like to use, you know, let's just say we're going to figure out who's going to, who's going to get eaten by the zombies or the lions or the bears or whatever. Hmm. And we line everybody up and you say, you got to run hundred meters. And if, for, if you're a male, if you can't run it in 15 seconds, that means you're going to get eaten. Right. And I kind of, you know, and, and, you know, you can, you can, you can sort of see how that plays out. Let's say, why can't I run hundred meters in 15 seconds? What's preventing me from doing that? Well, there's a couple of things. My joints are achy and they hurt. So can your diet fix your joints and make it not hurt so much? I, I think you can. Yes. So, so I think there's an impact on that. So if you, if you get a right diet, your joints start, start to hurt a little less. The next thing is, you know, are you, are you overweight? Or are you obese? If you got a big belly hanging around, you're not going to be moving out of the track very fast. So, you know, diet can impact, body composition the next component that goes into that is strength you got to be fast enough to, to propel your body down the track if you're weak you're not going to be able to be very fast and so and that's training things, yeah all those things come together you know if you look at the world record for the 15 for for 100 meters for for 85 years old it's 15 seconds so that's why i like to use that metric there's an 85 year old guy that can do it in 15 seconds so me as a 51 year old guy better be able to do that or I'm going to get eaten by the lion and he's going to keep going. I think that's a way to say, am I farther or closer from death? You know, I think it's, it's just a way to say, how am I preserving my health? And that's a good metric I think is, uh, can be used. I I have a, well, some people may feel it to be an inappropriate joke, but, uh, my, my fiance's sister, I guess you call her sister-in-law. Yeah. Sister-in-law. Um, I don't want to call her. She's not a trophy wife. She's actually a great mom, but she is like veal. There's does not train, no exercise. Thin as can be, you know, right. pretty, pretty girl. But I'm like, just, I always joke around like, you know, if and when the zombie apocalypse ever happens or being chased by a lion, um, I am throwing you out there first because you're going to help slow them down as I sprint off because I take care of myself. I strength train. People say I'm kind of an adrenaline junkie. That's part of my lifestyle brand because I want to be capable of doing anything. Like I, I mountain bike, I road bike, I crossfit, I, I, you know, I do lift weights. I, I was a USSA ski race coach for 11 years. Like I like to diversify the portfolio. <laughs> I, I love going skydiving. I'm planning right now our wedding, our wedding next uh, March will be in Banff, Canada. We're going to go heli skiing. So it's like, you know, I like to do things different. <laughs> yeah, Banff is it's beautiful. I got up to a place called Canmore, which is just outside of Banff. When I used to throw Highland Games, I went to a competition. Up there. It's a beautiful part of the oh, year. Man. But, yeah, to, but to your point, you know, like I said, look at me at 51. I can dunk a basketball. I can deadlift, rep out with 500 pounds on a deadlift. I can break a concept to a world record. Yeah, and you're, dude, you're a, a strong, healthy 250. I mean, we're not, I mean, you said your weight earlier. Ladies and gentlemen, I mean, again, um, I've done some video sharing on here. You got to follow him on Instagram too, because like you're not out of shape. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm pretty lean and I, you know, it's, it's functional. I, I'm not all, I'm not all show and no go. I mean, I, I mostly train for performance, you know, and it's just the muscles is kind of a side effect of doing that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's important to be able to do all those things. You should be strong. You should have some muscle on, you should be able to move. You should be able to jump. You should be able to 
run and throw. And I think those things are what we evolve for as humans. Well, you'll appreciate this. My fiance feels that um, when, before we got together, I was a little, I was a little bigger. Like it's, it's hard for me to put weight on. I don't know what it is. Uh, and I was joking around there about the, you were talking about the body temperature. Like I'm a furnace. I just, I put heat out. I, I have to sleep naked. I don't like, she's got the comforters. I have a, I have a sheet and that's it. Um, I'm thinking about buying one of those cooling mats that you could put under your mattress. I've been reading about this now because dude, I, I'm, I'm just a furnace. She appreciates it in the winter time, which is fine. Cause it's winter out here right now, but, uh, not in the summer. No. <laughs> Yeah, I'm the same way. I'm hot and she's cooler. You know, it's kind of one of those things where we kind of constantly, you know, I'm throwing the covers off and she's pulling them on. And, uh, you know, we complain about, you know, I'm like, I can only take so many clothes off. You can put another pajama on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you get down to naked in a sheet and that's all you got and you're still hot and then you're kind of miserable. Yeah, exactly. Oh, see, now you're getting me. I'm thinking about real quick for our listeners, and I'm actually our video watchers. I'm doing some screen sharing again. Again, on Instagram, you could follow him at Sean with a W, Sean Baker, 1967, um, because he's got all the steak on there. But, dude, there's some videos of you working out. You got some still photos of you. Like, again, um, I'm impressed by you because, again, you're proving that age, I say this all the time, age is only a number. And you, you physically represent that. Your, uh, your site, that on meat heels is showing before and afters right on that. And then you're also extrapolating data tracking too, right? Because you have this other site called n equals many.com. And I wanted to make sure we got this in here because I'm really, I love data and, and that's what you guys have been doing here, right? Yeah. We started back in August. We started collecting data on uh, people that signed up. We've had, I think now I have to look, I think we've had about 1400 people that have done at least a month of carnivore, uh, carnivore diet and or, or contributing data and so we're and we're adding to it constantly so there's people that are constantly signing up adding their data and so that database is going to continue to grow uh you know just just over time so i might need to i might not throw my hat in the ring on this one i don't know man i mean give it it a month and see what happens now you know i gotta go 100 percent uh well yeah i mean you know uh, i think you're gonna find it'll be the most interesting to do that it's only it's only 30 days i mean if you can get through fire school and all that stuff you can get through 30 days Suffering eating ribeyes every day, right? That's real Dude, I, I, I went through my first, uh, I, I followed a protocol from uh, the nutrition company I use is uh, Isogenics. And I use their, that's the first time I ever went through a detox and cleanse. And it's a 30-day program. But you only actually do four fasted days. And that's actually fasting is a natural part of the body. When you're sleeping, your body's in a fasted state. So it can actually attack. And then I, like this morning, I woke up and I uh, wasn't hungry. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to fuel myself off my fat. So I didn't, I didn't eat until one o'clock in the afternoon and I went to one of my local, my old uh, local cafes and I had my own omelet there and there was a new chef. So he's never made my omelet <laughs> and it's six eggs. Right. So it's a, it's a half a dozen eggs and then I have them throw bacon in it and vegetables and then a side of bacon. And then if I'm feeling fancy, I have them throw some smoked Gouda in there. Nice. And then good. the waitress just looked at me and she's just like, you're going to eat all that? I was like, Yeah. I was like, it's time, it's time for me to break my fast and have my breakfast. And then I was like, yeah, could you throw a cup of coffee in there and give me a scoop of butter? And then I put the butter, my butter in the coffee and she looked at me again and she's like, you're putting butter in your coffee? I was like, yeah, I do that once in a while. You know, I mean, whether you want to call it the bulletproof method or not, but it's like fat is fuel. <laughs> I don't know how better to say it. Uh, I'm sure you could back this up. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's, a, that's a good way to fuel our bodies. You know, like I said, that's the thing. I, I, you know, I, have kind of coined this term intermittent feasting because I, I, you know, nice. I just feast and then I may go 10, 12, 16 hours between meals. And, you know, it's just because I'm not hungry. And I think I'm, you know, the same thing's happening. It's just, a, it's a little bit of semantics on that, but I've gone into, uh, you know, I'll give you some example. I've gone to a restaurant, I'll, I'll order, you know, three ribeye steaks and have a side of 10 eggs and a couple orders of bacon and put that down. That'll be one of my feasts. Nice. So I, can, I can put it, I can put it away. I love well. it. So for the th- so for the and I, I, so for the thirty day challenge, because um, I'm already I'm clean, man. Like people say I'm crazy because like man, what do you eat? I'm like, what are you talking about? Like last night's Valentine's Day dinner, I had a filet mignon and I had um, a grand. There was other stuff in there, right? So it was it, they had shredded like sweet potato wrapped around shrimp uh, over a uh, um, diced up pork belly. Oh my God, that was amazing. That was my appetizer. Then there's a big old slab of filet and over a bed of uh, just, just, just uh, julienne carrots, right? Like it was, it was a nice place. 
Um, and then she couldn't eat all of her beef tenderloin. So I got to finish that. And obviously both of these were served rare because we, you know, we, we don't mess around. Um, so it was a great dinner. But now for the 30 day carnivore challenge, you want people to try going hundred percent meat, right? Yeah, I mean, that would be ideal. You know, we say meat and water. You know, there's a couple deviations. We'll let people, you know, if they want to have some eggs with that, that's fine. If they want to have a little bit of dairy. Because I do um, love my eggs. Man, yeah, it's a I mean, perfect you food. Know, like, you know, I used to eat, when I was doing a ketogenic diet, I would crush it. I would eat sometimes 18 eggs in a day. No problem. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but now, I, now I prefer, you know, it's kind of funny. Now I just prefer to eat steak all the time, which is kind of a interesting development. Um, well, the beauty is, like, this is good timing for me. I have my all my own beef. Like, I'm... I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah, I would love to hear about it. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see, see how you do. You know, I, you know, just read some of the stories about guys and their uh, performance in the gym. I mean, I've got, uh, there's one of the New Zealand All Blacks, you know, a guy named Owen Franks who started this, one of the best rugby players in the world who's, who's doing this and he's reporting. Oh, he's on your, he's on your Me Heal site, isn't he? Um, he no, he's on, uh, he follows me on Instagram and uh, I kind of chat with him a little bit. But he said he started this back, uh, you know, a little about two months ago. He says he's gotten bigger, he's gotten leaner, he's gotten stronger, and he's already one of the best athletes in the world, you know, so it's kind of interesting. We've got some... Like, I think I got him. Yeah, we've got one it, of the Canadian... Is that him? Thing. Uh, no, he's not. On, yeah, there he is on the left. Yeah, there yeah he he's, so he's on your before and after sites on the uh, carnivore training system. Yeah. Uh, maybe he is. I don't know. No, that's your site. Why. Oh, is it? Okay. I think Garvin, yeah. Garvin, there's a fellow from Ireland who helps maintain that site, so he must have uploaded yeah. uh, that as well. But uh, yeah, he's a, he's a big heavy hitter. There's a got a canadian powerlifter he's a canadian powerlifting champion he's got a bunch of records he started doing this uh he started he's a, he's a 165er and he just pulled 630 deadlift you know no what yeah. like wait he, he's 165 pounds 165 pounds pulled a pull one pulled a 630 pound deadlift with no belt uh so he's been on carnivore for a little over a month and his strength is just going through the roof so, see I, yeah, I haven't tested my pr in a while but yeah. I got nothing on that. I think the last time I tested my PR, I was only at 375, no belt. But I mean, I, at 6'4", yeah. and, and I'm sure you could pull more than that. But uh, I haven't been testing that in a while. So, um, yeah, but he's, there. He's, he's one of many people that are noticing pretty dramatic strength improvements, which I think is kind of cool. So, I mean, you got all this data coming in. You got three different sites to help show before and afters. You got the training protocols. You got this new, I love the Meat Heels site. Great branding, by the way. It's super clean and simple. I can't believe MeatHeels.com was actually available. Uh, nice score on the domain. <laughs> yeah, I started hashtagging that about six months ago, and I said, I better, I think it's going to go, so I'm going to go get the domain real quick. Yeah, and then right now, all the content on that site that we were sharing is basically – it's all the, the blogs are just each person's before and after and, and a short little bio on it, right? Yeah, that's, that's just a site to showcase, uh, you know, basically stories. You know, I think stories can be very powerful. We'll have a site where all the, data, the hard data comes in as well. But uh, we're getting a lot of people that, uh, I mean, I get stories every single day. I mean, I get literally. Oh, and you've, you've categorized them too here. Yeah. So you got them broken down by respiratory benefit or skin right. benefit, sleep right. fatigue. Nice. Right. So people, if somebody has an issue and they want to say, hey, I've got this issue, has anybody else solved the problem doing this? So they can look it up and then they get two or three stories. And like I said, we're going to probably add one a day or one every other day until we get hundreds on here, which and we've got tons in the, in the hopper waiting to go. So it's Well, fun. and I, I can back you up. Earlier, you mentioned something about like on here, you have a, a joint pain category. I can actually back you up right now because when I was firefighting, we had, I was hiking with 25 pound chainsaw, probably at, depending on what was in my pack. Cause we had to carry seven quarts of water, at least two MREs. Um, we had, and I was a chain, I was a Sawyer. So I had to carry extra spare chain for the chainsaw. You'd have fuel bar oil. So we were probably ranging between at least 40 to 50 pounds of gear, not including the saw. So part of that though is, Every night when I would go to bed uh, under the stars, we camp under the stars, my knees would just be throbbing and screaming because again, we were just eating anything. Like we figured out a Sawyer versus a digger because the rest of your crew were digging. And that's where I started my rookie year. Uh, we were burning on average 7,000 calories a day. As a Sawyer, you were probably ranging closer to 10,000. And I had no idea how to prepare for that. So our, our fire, uh, our fire camp lunches, they would give us a brown bag. We'd go pick up big boxes in the morning. Everybody would stuff their lunch in, in a bag. It was, I call it a meat wad. It was just really shitty lunch meat and cheese jammed between like white bread when that was always crappy by the time you actually pulled it out of your pack later in the day. And they'd have like an orange in there and like three cliff bars. Never touched a cliff bar again after that job. 
I, a cliff must have been sponsoring the U S forest service, man. There was just cliff bars out the butt. And anyway, but I had already had my shoulder rebuilt from ski crashes in 99. And then I had torn apart again in 2007, multiple dislocations. I opened bank cart reconstruction was the procedure they did. So I really did a number on it. And, uh, long story short, to get ready for fire, I was doing joint supplements. I was getting back into strength training. I had to get all the range of motion back because you got to do a certain amount of pull-ups and push-ups and everything else to qualify. Did all that. I beat everybody in the pack test. I would do 45. You had to do a, a three-mile speed hike with uh, 40 pounds a pack, a pack. You had to do that in 45 minutes or less. So did all that. Uh, and then, But I always had knee pain. And I was doing joint supplements and everything else. When I started cutting grain out of my life, that's why I back up Vin, Vinny here, man. NSNG, baby. No sugars, no grains. I was never a big sweets guy anyway. Uh, I, I went off of the joint supplement years ago. I don't have joint pain. And then I keep, keep focusing on cleaning up the diet, cleaning up the diet, cleaning up the diet. And then, I, you know, obviously, you got better skin and everything else. And this is not just including meat, right? I'm just saying no grain, no sugar meats and vegetables, you know, bacon, you know, broccoli, whatever. And to this day, I now drink bone broth for fun. I make my own bone broth. I eat bone marrow and no, no joint supplements, no pills. You know, I'm good. <laughs> and yeah, I'm 40 I think, now. You know, it's, I, th I think it's, you know, I'm seeing that repeatedly, you know, with, with that, that sort of taking out grain and, and, and sometimes other things as well. But I think we try to make it more complicated, but we have this issue and then we try to add something to our diet or add some magic supplement when we should be subtracting the, the stuff that's causing the damage. And I think that's what we're finding. That's what this meat only diet is very good at eliminating everything. You know, it's, it may not be what you need for everybody long term, but it certainly is a good way to sort of remove everything out of the diet, see how you do. And then you can potentially after, after a period of time, after adjustment, maybe add some things back in and see what you tolerate, which is, I think is fine as well. Well, and I think for your data on here as well, um, because I, I've been geeking out a lot since bringing on more scientists and stuff on the show that like, like Vinny has brought on, is there's this whole really wrapping your heads around your gut biology. And the other advantage of what people don't realize is when you, when you shift into a new lifestyle that's usually cleaner, like even going vegan and vegetarian, in the very beginning, if you had a really shitty diet before, that first period of shift, I don't care what healthier lifestyle you go, meat only, vegan, whatever, you're cleaning your diet up. You're probably taking out the fast food and the soda and everything else. So everybody initially is probably going to start feeling a little bit better because now you're letting your gut biology say, oh my God, they finally removed a big chunk of toxic crap so I can actually heal and recover. Um, and I think that's probably one of the other benefits initially of just going with the steak too is like, great, that forces you to take all your nasty crap that you add into your meals out of the equation. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people who will debate what our sort of, you know, our, our forebears or our, our paleolithic uh, ancestors ate. I don't know for sure, but I can guarantee they weren't eating tweaking Twinkies and donuts. I mean, no. We know that for sure. So if we take that stuff out of the diet, we're going to get better regardless. And then you can debate, you know, what we're designed to eat. And, you know, I think there's arguments on either side. I think I have a compelling argument for saying we ate a, a heavily meat-based diet. But, uh, uh, yeah, but I mean, yeah, I agree. You, you know, you, you're, any diet is better than the current sort of standard diet in, in Western diet, which is just garbage. And well, our, our sad diet, the standard American diet, it's sad. Yeah, and that's, and we're exporting that and there are people like making a lot of money on the sad diet, whether it's from the, 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 the sort of the cheap, uh, highly marked up, uh, nutrient devoid food or the, the, the medical care. That it's we're it's frustrating. Afterwards. Like we're supposed to be a powerhouse country setting an example for everybody else. And it pisses me off because I'm like, dude, I'm a proud American and, and I, I have my American flags hanging by my squat rack and I take this very seriously. And then we've got other countries looking to us for leadership and we got our heads so far up our corporate sponsored butts for grain and all and the sugar industry and everything else. We don't realize what we're doing to our own people, not, and let alone to the rest of the world. So I'm excited for your impact in Iceland, man. That's awesome that they, uh, so they invited you over there just to show off, hey, man, we're doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, Iceland's a, good, a neat place. I mean, they're going to – word travels fast. They're on major – you know, these this little diet's on major news channels and, and radio and TV and interviews on the newspaper. So they're going to make a big impact pretty quick. But, I mean, here's what I, I, I've often said. It's, you know, America was the, you know, the, the home of the free and the land of the brave. Land of the free and home of the brave, rather. And now we've become the home of the uh, sick and the, 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 the land of the weak. I mean, yep. it's, it's just, and we shouldn't be that. We should be, we have the financial capacity 
and the, the infrastructure to be a nation of strong, proud, you know, super people. And we're yeah. not. We're, we're this this debilitated people that's you know depending on uh, handouts. Well, you being a physician, I, I love bringing this up. When you got your education, you didn't learn anything about nutrition. They gave you what? Uh, every doctor I've asked this was on average, you get what? An hour? Talk about how things metabolize in the body, but there's no actual training or education around how food heals the body. There's no, no nutrition. No, it was all about deficiencies and, you know, and, and, and learning a little bit about uh, requirements, but there was no sort of application towards disease. You know, it was, it was very, at best, it was like you tell a patient, well, you need to lose weight. You know, and, and that's, that's as far as it goes. But as far as how does food impact disease, how does, you know, how can you potentially improve someone's health by modifying their diet? There's none of that at all. And that's, that, that's the sad part. Like, it's funny because I, people are like, well, you don't go to a doctor. And I said, I shouldn't have to go to a doctor. I don't know if you would agree with this, right? Like the doctors are there if I need them. And I don't, I don't, if I didn't cut or break myself, I haven't been back to my MD since I had like blood work run. And now, like, for example, I have a, I have a 23andMe uh, kit here that I'm going to be running. I have swab tests from Dr. Carson, who's a doctor of pharmacology out of, I forget what, he was on the show a while back, but he has a partnership with a lab that does swab tests now, some on hormonal analysis. So I'm going to be doing a lot of hacking this year. Because I want to start tracking like, hey, man, I want to prove why I'm so healthy, right? Let's do the hormonal analysis. I want to do advanced blood work now over the next couple of months. Like maybe, like if I'm doing all this and I'm going to try this too, and because like, I'm already 50% into your, into your protocols anyway, uh, is there any recommendations you have for people who listen that like are getting geeked out and hacking stuff like I am? Because like I said, I don't go back to a regular MD because unless I have a problem and half of them aren't educated like you on nutrition, they're usually just pushing drug as the answer. Well, I mean, that's part of the training. I mean, you learn what the disease and you learn what, what drug to get or what procedure to do. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the tools in a, in a physician's toolbox for most, mm -hmm. for most, for most cases. And so, but as far as, uh, you know, my recommendations, you know, I, again, I agree. The best way to not get sick is to stay out of the doctor's office. You know I mean? <laughs> if you don't need to go, don't go. I mean, that, that's what I would say for most people, you know, uh, but, you know, there, there's a big push for preventative health and stuff like that. But a lot, a lot of that stuff, you know, you can learn outside of the physician's office. And, and in a lot of cases, and it's a sad statement that the physicians are, are well, well beyond, behind the power curve on knowing how to manage and, and uh, sort of prevent disease, disease in many cases. Well, so, see, and you're a private practice, right? Well, I'm not actually, I'm not actually, actually actively practicing right now. Oh, okay, so, good. But, well, with uh, everything else you got going on, I don't know how you have time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've got a lot of other things going on. I'm, I'm finding more fulfillment out of uh, just helping people, you know, with, with the prevention aspect. And I think that's where we need to, we need to put our focus over time. But, I'm glad you're doing this because that's the, because like, doctors don't have the time to do what you've done. That's their excuse is they become, a lot of my friends who are doctors, uh, their practices got bought up by the big hospitals and now they're being driven by the protocols of you're just an assembly line, like in and out five, 10 minutes, boom, 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 boom. So how do you get time to really analyze somebody? And I feel that the doctors who are serious like you need to go freelance basically and start coaching people on health and fitness and really helping them figure out how to fuel their bodies better because then they don't have to go to an actual office <laughs> and they get yeah, drugs I mean, put in you. Yeah, that's exactly the same thing I experienced. You know, it was the same thing. It was a big hospital employed by that. And there was a, you know, it wasn't, it was basically an assembly line of medicine. You know, you just kind of in out, in out, get as many patients as you can sign up as many procedures as you can, you know, keep the hospital flow, make a profit for the hospital. And you were incentivized just to, just to do high volume, and it was very frustrating. And so I think that's what a lot of physicians find themselves in there, slaves to these electronic medical records, which, you know, you spend up being debt, debt entry clerks, and all you're doing is plugging in algorithms. You're not talking to the patients. You're not finding out any real, you know, real in-depth history. You don't look at the lifestyle factors more than just a cursory glance. Do you smoke or not? I mean, that's, that's about all it's come down to, you know, and so it's, it really, it, we've really gotten away from our roots and it's, uh, it's a corporate, it's been corporate, corporatized and it's been, uh, it's just a business now. And so, and, and a lot of patients are not getting as much uh, help from it as they could be with a, with a different approach, like what, what we're talking about with lifestyle and prevention. Well, so, so listen, so if our listeners are hearing all this and they've, we've had a lot of content today, cause I want to respect your time and help bring this, this show to a close. Um, 
obviously besides the carnivore training system, besides if they, if they want to look at data and see some before and afters and stuff, obviously n equals many.com. And again, our listeners know that I always put this stuff in the blog content. It'll be on the website. You can easily, you'll be able to find him everywhere on Twitter and Instagram. That's how Sean and I got connected, the power of Twitter. Um, and is there any messaging you want to kind of, I always let our co host kind of bring the show to a close with some final words, but is there any all encompassing messaging that you want to just give back to the audience out there? And it's like, listen, I mean, you forget everything else we talked about already today, but what is it that you're trying to move forward with here in 2018 and going forward, right? Like, is there something all encompassing sure. on all this? Sure. I think there's a big picture, common sense a way to approach health in general. And so I think, uh, something we've lost sight of because we have all these, you know, like I said, some of these hacking tools and data can get a little bit in the way of, you know, what is my joint health like? What is my digestion like? What's my mood like? What's my libido like? What's my body composition like? What's my mental health? What's my energy? What's my sleep like? And if all those things are pointing in the right direction, then you likely are, are healthy. And, you know, you can find an outlier blood test and people can get gets really they really get wound up tight about that. Say their cholesterol goes up, say they go on a diet and all these good things happen, but then their cholesterol goes up a few points. And all of a sudden they question themselves and their doctor wants to put them on a drug and tell them you're on the wrong diet. When Friggin' statins. Well, exactly. And I think we, we have this sort of lack of common sense, you know, and I, I just think that, uh, you know, people know when they're sick in a lot of cases, not always, but you can certainly point to things. If I get, if I get leaner, if I put on muscle, you know, if my joints stop hurting, then I'm doing the right things. And I think you have to learn to trust yourself. Uh, you can read every study in the world and you'll still not know the answer. You know, your doctors will have lots of opinions. You know, many doctors will just throw stuff at you just, just to guess. A lot of times they'll look at things based on a lab and not really get a good picture of what's going on. And, and you may be inappropriately treated that way. Wow. So... There you go, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you, could all, you could be like me too, where I've got all these ideas and all this hacking going on, but at least I've taken the steps to do self-education. And I think that's, that's, that's kind of a big message that I see from people like Vinny and like yourself, influencers like you guys, where it's like, guys, take accountability for your own health. Um, I've had other doctors on the show, you'll appreciate this message, Sean, where it's like, you know what, become your own inner physician. And it takes time. You're not going to know everything right away, but at least start understanding what's happening. Read some books. I mean, li listen to audible books, whatever. I promote audible all the time on this show. Like when I'm on my car. I don't listen to the radio. I I'm listening to podcasts and, and books. I mean, it's our, it's our accountability. Yeah. You have to be your own advocate. I mean, I will tell you as a physician, you know, I, I cared about my patients, but I care about myself and my family more. And uh, you know, I, you know, if you've only got 10 minutes to devote to for, for someone, you know, you, you just can't do what you need to do. And so you've got to spend that time. You've got to put in the hours, the time, the work to, to make your health as good as it can, it can be. And you can't put it in someone else's hands. Your physician, he just can't do it. No, definitely not. And actually, real quick, just to help bring the show to a close here, this is the, uh, your, your family here? Uh, yeah, that's part of my family. That's my, uh, my current girlfriend and our little boy, uh, Lucas. He's I think four in that picture I was taking in Hawaii. And then, he's got uh, some locks, man. Yeah. yeah, he's growing his, yeah she likes him having the long blonde hair. He's got a little surfer kid. And then uh, I've got three other children that aren't in that picture that, that uh, ages uh, 11, 10, and 7. So that's got, awesome, I got, man. I got four, four, kid, four kids. It keeps me busy. A lot of fun, though. Jeez, that's – yeah. I got zero. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, fill, I'm filling in with all my other time. <laughs> well, you, yeah. got, you, got, you got more time to calculate what you need to eat. I just I – just, Wolf a steak down and take care of my day then, you know. Boom. I, I, again, you got to love the simplicity of this. This carnivore challenge, man, I, it's, it's simple. It, people are looking for simple stuff. They might want to give this a shot, ladies and gentlemen. You got to check it out. So listen, hang tight. I want to give you a proper goodbye off the air. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Sean Baker of the Carnivore Training System. And as I hinted before, check out Meat Heels. Really cool new site. I'm excited for it. And definitely check out n equals many.com because I love data. And he's got a site literally trying to bring data to the masses. So you ever want to question something, go research and do some data. And he's got some sites for that too. So again, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for listening in. Check him out. Follow him. He's on Instagram. He's on Twitter. He's on Facebook. We'll have everything on the website shows like you always do. And as I always close the show out, remember you too can live the fuel. Have a great day. 
and you're free of the pod. I just leave a video on for extra content. So, oh, okay. I got you guys. Uh, okay. Well, hey, that was fun, Scott. Appreciate it. Yeah. I don't know how many shows you've been on where they let you just kind of freelance it like this. I mean, Vinny's is pretty open. That's pretty easy. Yeah. 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 We um, just kind of screw around. Yeah. But it's, uh, yeah, some of it's more formal and uh, straightforward question and answer, but yeah, this is kind of a fun format, so I enjoyed it. I just want people to have fun. I mean, because there's a lot of Q&A structured formats, and I could do that, but then a lot of times I hear the Q&A, and they're asking you the question, and then you answer, but then you might have let out a little nugget of knowledge, and they just breezed right over it, and they could have dug deeper into it, right? Sure. So, um, yeah, I'm excited by this, man. I I might have to give a shot for the a 30-day challenge here and just bang it out, because I already have all the meat I need. Is it, is it just beef or just any meat? No, it can be any meat. I think Ooh. most people, you know, I will yeah. tell you people that do it for a long time. People have done this for 10 years. They, they tend to gravitate towards steak. I mean, that's just, you know, beef is, is, is just what, uh, you it's know, you find most satisfying. I mean, I, I mean, if, if you, if you, if you say you could have any meat, what you, that you want, I'm going to pick a, I'm going to pick a ribeye steak probably 99 out of a hundred times, you know, just because it's, it's satisfying, man. It's really good. You know? It's, oh, I uh, had a final question. You and I both know how uh, fat cells obviously store toxins and excess, you know, whatever. It's at sure. least in the human body, right? So does that also come back to the importance of how we're sourcing our meat? Because like some people trying to do this can't afford to go organic and grass fed and everything else. But right. just to my knowledge and how the human body, you know, stores excess or puts toxicity into the fat cells, does that same thing in animals? Do you know? I mean, should uh, I be you know, worried I, about I, my fat that I'm eating? It's more of an issue with things like pigs and, and, and chickens, actually. I mean, mm. cow, cows have a pretty robust detox system, and so yeah. they tend not to store much stuff in their in their inner system. And so, I, okay. I think you're fine eating just you know the, the, the you know stuff that doesn't have to be grain fit, grass finished. I mean, you do fine yeah. with that. I think there's really, I mean, honestly, there's minimal nutritional difference, you know, when it comes to human health. I mean, there's some environmental impact issues that you know you can certainly do it for that reason. But if, but if you don't want to spend a ton of money on you know great grass finished everything which it can be very expensive when you're putting away four pounds of meat a day like i do that, that gets pretty pricey so dude my again my quarter it, all said and done once it dressed out i think i dropped about 800 bucks yeah. and i think that worked out to be right around like four bucks a pound you know averaged that's across true. all my roast steaks ground beef everything so that's and that was yeah. and that was grass fed and then he does a little grain for finishing at the end just to help it dress out nicer and they let, they let it hang for 20 days and all that before they actually they cut it up and then they vacuum pack it. It's a great, I mean, I'm, I'm hooked. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's a good way. If you, got, if you got a source like that, you know, and you like it, you know, continue to use it. There's nothing wrong with that. All right, game Peace on. So uh, if I, if I, I want to dig deeper into this because I didn't even know, I, I knew it with the challenge, but I'm like, I'm already halfway there. And actually my Kristen, my fiance, knew that I've been following you and she's just like, I'm surprised you're not doing that already. You freaking put down meat like a beast. And I'm like, yeah, I might have to make this official. Um, yeah, we'll do it. Yeah, do it. Do it. Uh, you know, if you got any questions, just hit me up on one of the one of the website. You know, one of the uh, you know email or whatever. Yeah, you know, Twitter or something like that. But uh, but basically, what you have on the n equals dot com site that link to the thirty day carnivore challenge. I could just uh, actually have a video there too. You have a YouTube video, so I can figure that out. Yeah, then, it's just, it, it details it. I mean, it's basically just meat, whatever meat you want. You know, it's, it's okay. you know, it's it's a little you know coffee if you drink it a little bit. A little bit of dairy, a little bit of eggs, and that's that's kind of the main. The main I'm not even big, I'm not even a big dairy guy. I have a little bit of cheese. I I'm not, I like yeah. cheese, you know. Yeah, but. that's about it. You know, maybe a little piece of cheese on a hamburger or something like that. And you guys are looking for data off of this, right? Like, now I'm yeah. I'm already I'm already pretty clean and fit, so I don't know how much new data I'm going to generate off of yeah, this. Yeah, I mean, but. you know, you can you know some of it can be subjective. We 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 collect both subjective and objective data. So if you've got uh, you know, overall, whatever subjective for how your digestion is, your, you know, you may, you take measurements, measure your waist size, body weight. Yeah, uh, you know, I do any, that. Any, any labs that you want to include, we're happy. We, we incorporate, we're just keep, we're just tracking labs and we don't expect you to get any particular labs, but we have some people that, that give us a whole bunch of stuff, you know, from microbiome to hormone profile testing to C-reactive protein. And so it's whatever you feel like testing, you just add it in before and after if you want. Like I said, I, I got the swab test sitting here that he shipped there me. There you go. I got the yeah. health and DNA history from 23andMe. I just didn't know if it's better to do this afterwards or, I mean. I don't think that'll make, I don't think the DNA, the DNA stuff will make a difference. You, should, no. you shouldn't change your DNA. That was, that was a Valentine's Day gift. Uh, no, shit, because um, just to understand more about my family lineage and all that stuff. But sure. I was intrigued to see how they're going to, what, what they're going to spit back on health. I'm really intrigued to see what they think they can tell me about my health based on my DNA. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, some of that, I mean, honestly, some of that's a little bit entertainment more than, than, than actual uh, utility that you can do with that with some of the DNA testing, but you know, probably yeah. interesting if nothing else. 
Well, it's nothing else. I get to make a new YouTube video and say, hey, guys, here's what I got from 23andMe. Sure. But I'm, I'm more excited by my chiropractic do- doctor does blood panel analysis. So she has all that knowledge. And she's like, yeah, she's like, I have a lab partner. She's like, it's like 200 bucks. We do all the blood sampling, ship it all. And she's like, we'll do a whole blow- full-blown analysis. So Yeah, the thing, the thing we have to be real, we have to be cognizant about the fact is, you know, even in ketogenic and low-carb diet, folks, that... The, the reference ranges may not apply. And so there's a lot of things like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over my labs at, with Rob Wolf and I'll talk about some of that stuff and somehow you know, the physiology is a little bit unique once you, once you step into the you know, all meat or the, or the ketogenic world. And so I think it's some, there's some interesting- Oh yeah, like I know, yeah. My, I know my cholesterol is higher, but it's the good cholesterol. Like people, people aren't doing particulate testing. You know, they need to do a, a full blown particulate level analysis and then you got to get dig deeper into the cholesterol profile. Don't just take the surface level crap. Well, and even that has some context behind it. You know, you have to look at underlying inflammation and insulin levels and stuff like that to worry whether it even makes an impact, even, even despite particle size. And so it's, Mm. uh, you know, there, there's a, there's a lot of levels there and, you know, we're, we're seeing things with glucose, blood glucose testing that has to be, you know, tied into insulin and glucagon levels. And so it's, there's, there's a whole bunch of things that, that are kind of coming out of this stuff, which is interesting. We're pushing the envelope a little bit. No, I'm excited. I'm loving yeah. this because it's, 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 it's so back to the basics. I, I was already, I'm already been a paleo practicer and I've been doing the ketogenic training and right. analysis on that anyway. So like I'm living in your world, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope you, I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. Like I said, it's, it's fun. And it's, it, you know, the funnest fun part for me is, is, you know, that meat heals, man, seeing all those people change their lives. And, uh, it's every day, every single day I get probably five or six people sending me some dramatic transformation which is just you know i I would love to do it just to add more fuel to the fire on my (laughs) anti-veganism yeah i i I, I will tell you that that is something that we we we, you know there is a a huge political movement and they're 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 going to tax meat and they're going to make it hard for us to obtain that stuff and so uh you know i think we have to start sticking up for ourselves and fighting back and you know just kind of come together and well, you'll have it on my end because my whole my whole yeah. family's my my mother my sorry my brother's business my dad's business they're all cattle brokers they all depend on that so trust me we'll uh, you'll have some voices on this side of the fence so yeah well uh, like I said I think the cattle industry needs to step up and do a better job because they've been taking it on the chin for so many years and they don't need to they they're selling a damn health food it's a healthy product and I want to I want to demonstrate that and once they do that they need to uh, you know they need to say and then, and then the environmental stuff I think is also really really. It's all uh, BS. BS. We actually, too, yeah. we, we give off more gases than they do. Uh, uh, Vinny made a joke. He's like, great. You switched to vegetarianism or veganism. He's like, you don't think you're giving out more gas as a human being? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a carbon sequestration part of it too. They, they put a lot of carbon back into the ground, which we don't even, we don't even calculate that into these mm-hmm. greenhouse equations. And so it's, it's, it's interesting. So hopefully that message will get out, but I think we have to one of the, you know, I think it's, there's, there's, there's three prongs. You gotta, you've got to uh, demonstrate the health. You got to demonstrate the environmental impact is good. And then you got to talk about the ethical stuff. And I think we can, we can do that, but we have to, we have, there, there's a lot of uh, negative propaganda we've got to overcome to get there. Well, I'll be happy to support you guys. This is just one more podcast to help fuel the fire and help grow your brand better. Um, I will say I, I did, I did those, I shared that photo of you in uh, Iceland and then obviously the family photo, but I noticed your Twitter has more of the, the like the buff pick. Is there a more preferred profile image? Because I'll be putting this out over social media and everything else with a graphic and everything. So I just want to make sure I show you uh, off. Oh right no, I, I think those are fine. You know, I think okay. uh, you know I have enough of that stuff up there with me working out that people can see it. And, you know, they they can tell Good. that I they can tell I'm not a slob. You know, it's kind of. You know, and this is nice vegan. too. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, exactly. And I, actually, I like the Iceland pick. That was just pretty cool because it has the big plate of steak, and it's like, yes, that looks amazing. So, um, well, good. All right. Well, they're good. I, I'll, uh, I'll. I always. You're, you're. I'm usually about two to. Th- I'm usually two to three weeks out right now on release. So you'll be okay. out w- within the month. So, right. and then right. I shoot. I shoot an email back, giving everybody a heads up, like, hey, your podcast is live. Here's your links, and then you can add it to your. Uh, you know, getting more yeah. brand growth out there. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely hit it up on social media when it comes out. So, thank and your you guy much. in Ireland, I don't know which site you might want to do it on. You might want to consider putting all of your appearances, all these shows you've been on, yeah. like maybe build a, 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 media, a media page or a, a PR campaign page. Yeah. And that way people could see that, wow, you've been on a lot of platforms. Yeah, I mean, I've been on, I've been on like 20 some podcasts. Of course, obviously Joe Rogan's show is a big popular one for me. Oh yeah, I love Joe, man. That's, that's the only one my fiance yeah. listens to. <laughs> Oh, okay. And yeah, I've got a couple, a uh, couple, yeah, I've got Rob Wolf's coming up and some other ones. So those, those Rob's are great. Really I follow him as well. 
Yeah. He's, he's going to really help you. He's, his yeah. show's been around longer. So uh, my yeah. show's a year and a half. So we're still growing. The, I keep bringing on people like Vinny comes on all the time. It's, yeah. he, he gives me a nice bump in rating. So we, we're still cross-pollinating and I love it. It just keeps growing the show. So, Good for you. Good for you yeah. guys. Well, that's it. Yeah, I've got Mark Mark Bell's podcast to be coming out pretty soon. He's pretty big in the, in the powerlifting strength training world. So I don't know if you know. Oh, yeah. That. So, yeah, I did one of them a couple of weeks ago. So that should come out pretty soon. What's the name so, of his show? I think he's called it The Power Project now. It used to be The Power Cast, but he changed because okay. one of the guys he left, so he's renamed it The Power Project. No. I think I, I think my episode with him will come out maybe 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 this week. I'm not I got sure. a lot of friends from the barbell world, the weightlifting club world and stuff too, and they yeah. – they usually follow any guy I bring on that's powerlifting or weightlifting. I'll have to share that yeah. thing because you'll probably you'll be tweeting that, right? Because yeah, I follow yeah. you. All right. Yeah. As soon as that comes out, I'm gonna because I'll be able to message that to them because they're looking for new podcasts that have that focus. Sure. So, all right, man. Well, I'm gonna go eat a steak, man, Scott. I appreciate it. Maybe we'll do it again in, in the not too distant future. I hope you are more than welcome back, sir. Thank you so okay. much for coming on. All right, man. Okay, we'll see you later. Take, Take care. care.